Good morning, church. It's time for Calvary Southbury's online Sunday experience. It's beautiful to be with you today for Church From Home. My name is Lisa. I'm the Connections Director at Calvary Southbury. Now that you know who I am, why don't you tell me who you are? A quick and easy way to do that is to text here I am to 97000. Grab your phone and just follow along at the bottom of your screen. If it's your first time texting, you'll get a message back with a link. Click that link to give us your name and your email. We want to celebrate you. We want to connect with you. So thanks for texting us. I also want to let you know that Calvary Southbury is in phase two of our reemergence. That means that in addition to our online Sunday experience, we're also gathering outside our new church property for our Sunday celebration at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So if you're able and you're ready, we invite you to join us there. Our new address is 354 Kettletown Road in Southbury. Couple of things to remember, bring a chair or a blanket so you're comfy. And also in the spirit of love and putting others first, we ask you to please wear a mask and continue to practice social distancing. Also, this is weather permitting, so if it rains, we will cancel, but the good news is you can still join us online. Last but not least, I wanna recognize our 2020 high school graduates. Max Cunningham, Claire Eastwood, Sophia Falanka, Grace O'Connell, and Dixie Russian. Congratulations, may God direct your path and bless your future. So now we get to join together in worship. But before we do that, would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this day and for this technology that allows us to be together even when we are apart. We welcome you into our homes or wherever it is that we are. And we ask you to meet us here. Lord, thank you for your great love for us. May you be blessed by our worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Good morning. So glad to have you uh, here this morning. So glad that we could worship the Lord together wherever we're at. Uh, in our homes, we are still one body, unified by what Jesus Christ has done. He saved us. He's ransomed us. He's redeemed us. He's poured out his grace and mercy as he died for us on the cross. And that is worth celebrating this morning. So I just invite you to do that. Hey, why don't we just um, prepare our hearts in prayer and then we'll uh, worship together here. So Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're so good. You're so gracious. You're so worthy of all of our praise. Lord, even when times are hard, Lord, we have resolved to worship you. And so Lord, we're gonna do that together, Lord, because we are so hopeful of what you can do, Lord. We're hopeful that you are a God who can use uh, difficult circumstances, Lord. You can, you can uh, continue to bring us forward, Lord, and advance your kingdom in the midst of any time or place or challenge, Lord. Uh, so we trust you all the more right now, Lord Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, to uh, give us a vision for what you're doing in this time. I pray that in Jesus' name. Awesome. So, so glad you're with us. Why don't you just stand up wherever you're at, on your couch, you know, wherever you wanna praise the Lord at. That's the place where you're just going to say, hey God, this is, this is a time for you. We don't care if I'm alone or if I'm with my family. We're gonna take this time. We're gonna sing out to you. We're gonna worship you wherever we are. So why don't you do that? And uh, yeah, let's, let's do this.
fly. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what love looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks 
like your way of loving us.
truly, Lord, there's nothing you can't do. Lord, there's no uh, darkness that you can't light up. Lord, there's no uh, hidden place that you can't bring forward, Lord, and, and wash clean. Lord, there's no stain or spot <laughs> that could possibly uh, be kept back for the power of your grace, Lord, if we would just open our lives to you, open our hearts to you, Lord. So we come to you now, Lord, in expectancy and hope, Lord, not just hopeful that you can change our circumstances, Lord, but that you can change us. Lord, you can change our very selves. Lord, you can take our apathy and give us zeal. Lord, you can take our uh, defensiveness and give us openness. Lord, you can take our uh, doubt and our faithlessness and our anxieties, Lord, and give us faith hope, Lord, and you can fill us with love, Lord. Use us, Lord. We are yours. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Worship always helps to get our minds focused on Jesus and prepare our hearts to hear from God, doesn't it? Let's pray together before we open God's word. Father God, we adore you. As we open your word, may we hear you speak to us. Lord, you know exactly where we are, our struggles, our joys, and our doubts. May your word be written on our hearts today. Reveal yourself to us through it and transform us by it. In Jesus' name, amen. So grab your Bible or open your Bible app and let's look at the book of John together. We'll finish chapter 6 today. So let's start in verse 60 and read together through the end. Therefore, many of his disciples... When they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Hey, everybody, let's, um, let's open up in a word of prayer. Jesus, it is just so good to be able to open up your word together. Um, even as we study this passage today and we look at like this multitude that just walks away from you, um, we pray that we would learn from them today. God, we want to learn from their mistake. We want to learn from, from the way that the 11 pressed into you and pursued you. So Jesus, we pray that our hearts would be open and we pray that you would just speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, we are here at the church property. It is a construction site. I am sure you're going to get added um, sound effects coming through the mic at various times. You hear some crashes, people yelling and all that's all part of it here. Hey, but we are in this passage today where those who followed Jesus for a time, there's about 20,000 of them, they turned away like Thanks very much, Jesus, but like we've had enough. And then there is a small group, the 12, are singled out. And they, they seem to, they seek to pursue Jesus the more. And actually in one of them, Jesus says, is the devil, Judas Iscariot. So it's a crazy passage. And on a personal level, which connects me with this, with this whole passage, it's, it's just simply this. I want to be one of the ones that stick with Jesus. Like the 20,000 can fall away, but like I know where I want to be at the end of the day. And I know where I want to, so I know where I want to stand. And so we have some great instruction here today on how to make sure that that happens, that we are the ones who are seeking Jesus and pursuing him at the end of the day. 
So there were crazy events going on around Jesus. I mean, it looked like, if you were with Jesus at the time, it looked like everything was falling apart. I mean, you know, most of the disciples left, but things weren't falling apart at all. Jesus was just making clear to people their hearts. And those that wanted to pursue him stayed right there with him. Well, Look, I can't tell you how blessed I am to be here, even in this place today. I mean, there's people all around working. We're we're in the church property. We closed down the church offices this week at Bennett Square. We've been there for over 20 years, renting in some way or another. Um, So that's closed down now. The synagogue that we were meeting at for like two years, uh, that's also closed. We don't even know when they're going to open up that building again. But we finished there, and we are in the finishing weeks here at the church church building. And uh, of course, right now we're in our phase two of reemergence from the whole COVID thing. And we are having outdoor celebrations today. So if you're watching this at 9 a.m., 11, we're going to be outside. So you could just run over here and catch our outdoor service at that. So um, at 9 and 11 today, June 7th and June 14th, we are going to be in phase two of our reemergence. And that is outdoor celebrations. We are just going to be raising our voices unto the Lord, singing unto him enjoying one another, studying God's word together, praying for one another, sharing God. Yeah, and so it's just going to be awesome. No children's ministry yet. It's coming, but not yet. Well, I'm here in this building and in the, actually the edge of the coffee house area. Um, and, it, and it's amazing. You could just imagine when we just get to be in here and get to worship together and just get to fellowship together. It's beautiful. I was in the worship center a little while ago, and it's just intense, intense. Well, I, God has great things ahead for us. I, I, I just can't even imagine, but this place just crackles. Well, listen, um, our passage today that we're looking at is intense, Jesus didn't seem to do things that weren't really intense. I mean, he doesn't really allow people to get too comfortable, if you, if you notice that. I mean, you might, like, resonate with a teaching of his, and, like, people were. They were, like, resonating with him and all that, and, like, like, he had them right there. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wham, out of, like, left field. Here comes a teaching that's just intense and hard. I mean, you know, Jesus, like, when he gave those teachings, like, his like following after him, like he held people of like, um, to, a, to a place of where he just expected alignment. It wasn't like you could just go, oh, well, you know, I like this teaching over here by Jesus. I like that one there. But, you know, this one in here I really don't like too much. I'll just pass that for another time. No, Jesus expected full alignment. In fact, when it seemed like things were, you know, not very intense, kind of comfortable, uh, leave it to Jesus to just stir the pot. And that's what happened. And people, the scripture said, were scandalized. Scandalized. Now, we're familiar with that in our culture, right? Scandal. I mean, there's scandals everywhere. At every turn, people are yelling scandal. Scandals don't actually have to be factual to be a scandal. They could be completely fabricated. Indeed, you know, I like even think about like this whole social distancing stuff and wearing, wearing masks. And some people are just screaming scandal. It's all scandal. You know, the infection isn't what people said it was going to be. It's a means of control of higher powers or this there's one world system trying to exercise control. You know, big ones come. All this and scandal. People yell. Uh, presidents of the United States, ever since I can remember, they've always had some scandal that's been tagged on with their name. And that's the way that it works, right? I mean, if, whether it's fabricated or not, it's already there. And many of them have that. And then, of course, then we have, like, the money scandals. And one of the, one of the ones that was actually infamous was one of the original ones, and that was from this guy named Charles in the 1920s, early 1920s. Actually, we're in 2020 right now. My kids are so excited going into 2020, saying, like, the roaring 20s, this is going to be awesome. And then COVID, and then lockdowns, you know, and then, of course, all the, the racism stuff and another thing. Well, this is the 20s, too. And this guy named Charles burst onto the scene, in the money scene in Boston, unknown at the time, but he would soon become a household name. See, what he had was he had this company and he convinced people to invest in it. It was called the Securities Exchange Company. It was a new business, savvy salesman, selling initially, this is what he sold, international reply coupons for postage stamps. 
I don't know what they are either. Okay, but Securities Exchange Company was a massive hit. And not only, for the, not only for these coupons that he sold, but he promised that if you invested in his company in only 45 days, you would receive 50% of what you invested in back. So profit, 55% profit. After 90 days, he guaranteed 100%. And you know what? It like worked. At least it worked for a time. I mean, some people got rich and rich fast off of this stuff. In fact, people started to actually mortgage their homes, mortgage their homes. And the guy in a, sh in a few short months had $15 million in hand. This was 1920. Well, of course, soon enough, it all imploded. Charles was arrested, charged with multiple counts of theft and fraud. What was the man's last name? Ponzi. Charles Ponzi. He became synonymous with the Ponzi schemes. Scandal. And of course, then Connecticut had our own scandal of late, you know, Bernie Madoff with this whole Ponzi scheme. Uh, in fact, that thing was absolutely massive. 4,800 clients in that thing. 4,800. And the fraud estimated to be $64.8 billion. Scandal. I loved that guy was absolutely loved by many until found out what the scandal was and he was hated by more than he was loved. But scandals come in different sizes, different shapes. And of course, you know, you have the whole abuse of power and all that and, you know, the racism and we hear scandal just yelling, being yelled everywhere. A scandal is an action or an event regarded as morally or legally wrong that causes public outrage. It could be factual or it could be fabricated. See, Jesus turned to the crowd there in verse 61, and he said, he said, does this offend you? Does this offend you? He had just given this hard teaching, and now he calls people out on it, on what it meant to follow him. And he calls them to that. And this is what happened, verse 60. It said, therefore, many of his disciples, notice that, disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus saw, or when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? This offends you. That word for offend is the, the original, in the original language, at least the Lima form, is scandalizo. Yeah, where we get scandalized from. And so Jesus is saying, hey, like, is, is this scandalous to you? Is this scandalous? Like, that I say that I am greater than Moses. Is, is that scandalous to you? That, that I say, and I am God in the flesh walking among you. Does that sound scandalous to you? That I say that I am the bread of life, that you have to eat of me, that I am real food, that you have to hunger after me the same way that you would hunger after food, that you need to do that spiritually or you don't have everlasting life in you. Does that sound scandalous? Is it scandalous to you to hear me say, I am real food? food and real drink. Scandalous? A lot of people thought so. Do you think I'm ripping you off spiritually, morally? Verse 62. Jesus said then, well, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? So now most scholars feel that when Jesus said, when you see me ascend where is before, that he wasn't just speaking about the ascension, which, which he was speaking about that, but he was speaking about that whole period of time. And so he's, Jesus is saying to them, hey, it's, this is scandalous to you when you're hearing a hard teaching of mine. Well, what's going to happen when you see me betrayed? What's going to happen when you're going to see me tried? What's going to happen when you start seeing me defrauded or, or, um, or whipped or tortured, flogged? What's going to happen when you see me nailed to that tree, to that cross, and you see the life being taken out of me, or the sins of the world being placed onto me, and my righteousness being able to be transferred to other people? Because that's what happened on the cross. The cross is a substitutionary atonement. Our transgressions, our sins, our failure, our separation from God was transferred over to Jesus, and Jesus' righteousness was transferred to us. He became our substitute and gave of his righteousness to us. And he said, look, if you can't handle the teaching that I'm giving you at this point in time, what are you going to think when you see the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension? Like, if you, if you can't run now, what's going to happen when things get real hairy? It's like what God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet. He, Jeremiah was just so done. He's like, I'm done pastoring these people of Israel. I, I'm like ready to quit. These people aren't listening to me. Like, they're just yelling scandal at every turn. And, and God just stopped Jeremiah, and he, he rebuked him with this. He said, 
He said, if, you, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, how are you going to contend with the horses? Thanks, God. <laughs> you know, it's like not much of an encouragement there, right? But God's just calling them out on it. It's like things are going to get harder. You know, Jesus would tell us, like he told them back, to, back there, like hard times are going to come. And you're going to get hit by hard times. And with hard times are going to come the opportunity for compromise to make life easier. Be careful. You know, Jesus didn't think it was that important to not offend people. That is, when something was important and something needed to be said. He wasn't trying to keep a crowd. He wasn't trying to give people, like, what they needed to hear. He he was upsetting. Their whole worldview at this point in time, and I, and I hope you realize that. I mean, he was challenging them. He was challenging long-held wrong beliefs. Like, you have prejudices that are not of God, that are not accurate, that are not of the kingdom of God. And their whole world is getting turned upside down at this point in time. You know, they believed Israel was it. I, I mean, you want, you want to talk about racism. I mean, early Israel, like right then, I mean, godly men in Israel woke up every day and prayed this prayer. Thank you, God, that I was not born a woman, a dog, or a non-Jew, a Gentile. And Jesus is flat out telling them, look, if you believe in me, if you're going to follow me, you're going to be called to live on a whole nother level. Whole nother level. There's going to be old ways that you are going to be dying to and old ways that you that used to see things in a way that you used to believe. And you're going to have to lay those things down because these people were believing a lie. And their eternal destiny was at stake. And there is a mandate at that point in time to correct them. When people are living in illusion that is hurting their eternal destiny, there's a mandate to correct. Well, verse 63, it goes on, and Jesus said, it's, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Look, I cannot emphasize to you enough that God's word brings life. I can't emphasize that much. It's it's so important to be in God's word. God's word is what gives us faith. That is true faith. Faith comes by hearing, the scripture says, and hearing by the word of God. Um, In in Timothy, Paul was telling Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed, and it is what we need for teaching. It's, it's, It's what we need for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we might be complete, fully equipped, for every good work. God, God's word is what does that. Jesus said, look, it's the spirit. He's the one that gives life. And then he said this, he says, and the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So often in scripture, you'll see this go on where we'll see the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of God's word, and they just swap back and forth. They're used in the same way. So like in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21, we're not going to read the passage, so you can read it later. We're, we're told in that passage, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us these instructions of walking in this new life. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, We are given almost the exact same teaching, but instead of being told to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're told to have God's word dwell in us richly. So like, which is it? The Spirit and being filled with the Spirit? Or is it being fulfilled with the word? Yes, they work hand in hand in our lives and among us. And so Jesus said, the flesh, it, it profits nothing. When it comes to entrance into the kingdom of God, the flesh profits nothing. It it can't produce. It can't bring entrance into the kingdom of God. It doesn't even know the way into the kingdom of God. But the word of God and the spirit of God working in conjunction has that power. That's why 
so often after our celebrations on Sundays, you know, when we used to get together, even like we're meeting today, we give people an opportunity to respond to the gospel, to receive Jesus. Well, why? Because we know when the word is being preached and when, 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 the, when the word's being preached that there's faith in the air and that the Holy Spirit is working to convict people of sin. And we're telling people, hey, respond now when God gives you the understanding. Like, you can't make that happen. You can't open up your understanding. You don't have that capacity. But the Spirit of God does, working with the Word of God. And what we do is we call people to respond, and we call them to respond now. Not to wait. Not to wait, like, till, you know, tomorrow or to, to next week. Well, why? Because our understanding is open now. We don't know when our understanding will have that breakthrough Again, and I mean, like today, if you're listening and you want to respond to the gospel, just text 97000 and type in the word adopted because you are adopted into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ. And we'll get a hold of you. We'll pray with you. We'll give you some material. Going on, verse 64. So Jesus said, um, oh, but there were many. Jesus said, there are many of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Now, there's somewhere around 20,000 people that Jesus just got done feeding on the other side of Galilee. They ran to meet him in that place. So they ran from all over the place to meet him in that place. I don't know how many followed him to this place, to Capernaum, but this is a, this is a population area. The other place where he fed them wasn't. And so you would have upwards probably even better than 20,000 people at this point in time that called themselves Jesus' disciples. In fact, the scripture calls them Jesus' disciples. They're following him. And yet Jesus just said they don't believe in him. So they didn't believe in Jesus, and yet they were his disciples. Yup. Jesus just got done telling us about belief. That belief, when it is real, it creates a real hunger and a real thirst that needs to be fed just like food does for the physical body. Verse 65, and he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. Uh, that's an amazing verse. It goes along with um, the verse from 44 last week where Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So like if we don't have a hunger and thirst for Jesus, the path of the 20,000 is going to be our path. That is unless you don't want it to be. You go, well, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, you can ask for the gift to hunger and thirst after him. You could ask for that. You can ask for that gift that wells up into everlasting life. I, I remember when I first came to believe in Jesus, or I was in a process of coming to him, I, I, was, I was just absolutely convinced, like I just wasn't chosen by God, like I wasn't one of his elect. I, I didn't know where I picked up that teaching, but it was like a cancer in me. And I was just like knew that like I wasn't called by God. And so what did I do? Well, I asked, I, I, I begged, and then I said, listen, God, you know, I don't know if you've chosen me or not. It doesn't seem like it, but I'm going to follow Jesus anyway because I have found that he is true and his ways are good. You know, sometimes, sometimes we just have to do violence to our apathy. If you're wondering if I've been called, if you've been called by God, don't stay in that place and just go, well, you know, what am I supposed to do about it? God's going to do what God's going to do. No, no, no. You press, you ask, you beg, you tell God, like, I am blind, God. I don't even know how to say God. I'm like, I don't have understanding and I don't know how to have understanding. My heart, it doesn't seem to grasp this stuff, but like, you know how to do that. So you know how to reach me. Jesus also said he would by no means cast out anyone that came to him. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples, so that 20,000 plus people, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They were scandalized. It's a scandal. 
We don't like your teaching. You're not giving us what we want. Verse 67. And then Jesus said to the twelve, Well, do you not want to go away? Do you not also want to go away? Verse 68. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Peter just knocked it clean out of the park right there. I mean, it's just awesome. And then he goes on with this beautiful profession. Verse 69, also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, that you are the Son of the living God. And after that profession, Jesus says right back to him in verse 70, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is the devil? And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Okay, so what makes some finish well and others turn away? You know, or, or to put it another way, how can I be sure that I land standing with Jesus? How can I be sure that I land standing with the 11? At, at the end of the day, like, I know where I want to be. Okay, I want to be with the 11. So how can I make sure that I'm there? Three things, three things, and I think we learn it from this passage really, really well. Um, first is this, we need to have the perceived need. Like, I need to have a perceived need. Perceived need will be a determining factor if I am like, well, you know, I'm pretty good with God. You know, me and Jesus, we're sort of buddies. You know, he's my guru type of thing, my friend versus being my Lord. Because look, when trouble comes, and trouble will come, right? Or when times get tough, and they will get tough, I'm going to weigh out my following Jesus with my self-preservation, and my self-gratification. And whether that be materially, whether it be with my energies, whether it be with my finances, whether it be like the sources of my pleasure, whether it be with, with, my, do, with my devotions. So like we have to answer the question, what, how, how, what is my need for Jesus? What is it? Where were you? I mean, where were you when, when Jesus found you or you found him, however you want to word it? What was your state at that point in time? Wrecked by sin? Needing a savior? Or, or just needing like to be more rounded of a person? Like that rescue was a picture of a greater rescue that's coming. This crowd was upset at Jesus and the, and the words that Jesus used. It upset their worldview. Does Jesus have permission to upset your worldview, turn your world upside down, does he? Does the Jesus have permission to lead you on a path that you didn't want to go on? You, you know, one that, like, okay, well, you had this thing set in mind. Does Jesus have permission to turn that upside down on you? You know, they wanted Jesus to be king. They wanted him to be ruler. They wanted him to kill all their enemies and bring in the kingdom of God. They're getting a king that would love their enemies and offer salvation to them and give them an equal place in the kingdom of God. Is that okay? Is it okay if he takes your plans of the future and says, no, nah, I have something else in mind. And what I have in mind is going to impact people for eternity. Does he have permission? Does he have permission to trash your prejudices, your long-held beliefs, your, the ways of seeing other people? Look, if Jesus is just the icing on your cake to make you more of a rounded person or make you more whole. Eventually, it is going to be, hey, thank you very much, Jesus. And it's great, like, been walking with you and all that. But, like, right now, just right now, you know, I've got, there, there's, there's places to go. There's people to see. There's, there's things I've got to do. I'm just busy right now. I'll, I'll see you later. I still believe in you and everything like that. I'm not going to stop that. It's just that right now, I have some dreams and you know, you know, it might not seem to fit into all the, see things the same way I do. Judas, Judas still believed in Jesus. He still believed in him. He just couldn't stick with Jesus. Why? I don't know all the reasons. Maybe he had trust issues. Maybe he had greed issues. I don't, I don't know. Whatever it was, he left. So what's, what's it going to be? Where are you going to be? Are you going to, are you going to stay with, with, the, with the multitude, with Judas, or are you going to say with Peter, like, like, Jesus, where can we go? 
Like, you have the words of eternal life. Like, you have wrecked us for anything less than all of you. Like, you, you, your word has, has ministered to us. It, it's touched us in, in ways that nothing else has touched us before. We have tasted of you and of your kingdom. And our, our cores have been altered by you. You have spoken to us in ways that nothing else can or ever will again. Where can we go? You have words of everlasting life. Perceived need. Absolutely essential. Second, we need to deal with self. So we need perceived need, but we also need to deal with self. In the case of Judas, he never dealt with self. I mean, like, I don't, he had some kind of peace agreement with self or the flesh. We can do that. Throw self a bone once in a while. You know, allow allowances in my life that will, you know, allow me to not deal with my greed or racism or my dishonesty. I allow myself to engage in, what, you know, what I want as long as it, like, doesn't surface and rear its ugly head. I, I had a dream a, a, a while ago when I was struggling with something, praying about it before God and just asking him about this thing I was going through. And he gave me a, a, a dream to rebuke me. And sometimes he does that in dreams. And I'm very thankful for that. But it was this dream where an old friend and, and myself stole an airplane, like a 747 type of airplane. And we were like thrilled in a dream. No one's watching. Easy acquisition and all that. And then I wake up in, in the dream the next morning and I look across the street and there's a field there. And the 747 is like sitting right there. And I remember looking at it going like, how in the world are we going to hide that? We're going to be found out. Yeah, Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 3, he said, there's nothing covered that will not be revealed. There's nothing hidden that will not be known. Therefore, what you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you've spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the households, from the housetops. See, Jesus loves you and me way too much to leave us in the state that he's found us or to leave us in the state that we are. He, he'll never force us to let, to, to let go of something. He never will. He'll never force us to obey, to, 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 to obey him or to choose him. He'll never do that. I remember as a, as a new believer, one of my prayers used to be, God, you know, um, Give me, uh, take my will away, Lord. I just want your will, you know, like force me to do your will because I just want to follow after you. And, and those were like, you know, well-meaning prayers and all that. But you know what? God has given us this beautiful gift of free will and he's never going to take it from us. This is what separates us from all other created things. We choose to follow him or not. We choose to worship him or not. And I know sometimes this free will gets so shackled down like in, in addictions and like mindsets and all that stuff that we wish it was gone. We wish we could just be robots and just kind of like do the things that are, that are holy and right and all that kind of stuff. God will never do that. But those very things offer us an opportunity to enter into the greatest acts of worship that are available to us. See, when you battle to worship him, it puts on a whole new level of how our worship goes up before him. When you have to fight tooth and nail to lay down self, to choose to follow him and to worship him, that becomes beautiful in his sight. Don't despise that. Like, embrace it for what it is. David, David in, in dealing with self, David said this in, in, in Psalm 42. He said, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Do you see, do you feel what David's saying? See, David is saying to self, he's dealing with self, he's speaking to his core, to, to his soul, to his flesh, and he's saying, hey, he's saying, hey, hold on a second. He says, I know you're bummed out, I know you're depressed, but this is what we are going to do. We are going to praise him. That's what we're going to do. You can read the verses right before that, verses 9 and 10. He said this, he said, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go away around mourning because of the oppression of my enemies as with the breaking of my bones? My enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? You see, David had every reason why not to follow. 
He had every reason why not to praise, not to worship. But what's his counsel to self? He deals with self and he says, no, we will praise him. Self is dealt with from perceived need that's become my known need to now I will worship him. Third, third, in order to finish well, you need to do this. You need to know your ending. Know your ending. See, the 20,000 didn't know where they wanted to end. That was the problem. Like I said in the beginning, the 20,000 can fall away and go and do their own thing. But at the end of the day, like, I know where I want to be. I know where I want to land. So, like, where do you want to land at the end of the day? I mean, you know, like, where do you want to land at, at the end of, of a decade or, or the end of life? Where do you, where do you want to land? I mean, this is, there are some choices in life that you get to make. And you get to determine. This is one of them. Like, you don't get to choose or determine whether or not you're going to be financially secure. I mean, you can do some things to maybe bring it about, but, like, you don't know what the economy is going to do. You know, COVID can hit again, right? Everything can get flipped upside down in, in like, a moment. You, you don't get to choose whether or not you can have, you have good health. I mean, sure, you can eat well, you can exercise, do those kinds of things, but you don't, that's not going to determine, I mean, those are good things to do, but something can happen to you just instantly. Like, you don't know, you don't get to determine whether hardship's going to come your way, or tragedy, when they're going to happen in, in life. You don't get to choose, but what you do get to choose is this, whether or not you will follow Jesus. And Jesus said the decision to follow him is going to be daily. He said, if anyone desires to follow after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me, daily. 20,000 didn't have destination in mind. And so when it came to something that they didn't like, when it came to things like, like, I didn't want to hear that, I didn't like the way that you said that, I have a different opinion than you, and all this kind of stuff. It, when it came to that, when it comes to true hardships, or when tragedies hit, when it, when it comes to things where you go, man, I thought things were going to be different than this, following after Jesus. When it comes to demands on my time, on my energies, on my resources, or when I'm being challenged to think outside of my box that I've just gotten used to, what happens? Well, Jesus and following after him is going to be secondary. It's going to be something I do when it's convenient. It's going to be something I do after I cut this deal. It's going to be something I do after I'm not so busy. Something I'm going to do after I like, spend all this money. Something I do after like, I spew out my own opinion. Something I do after like, I give this piece in person like, a piece of my mind. It's going to be something I do after you know, I get what's mine or I stand up for my rights. No one's going to take advantage of me. Right? It's going to be something I do after I get angry in traffic or, you know, or something I do after I say, well, who, you know, no one's going to make me stand on some X or walk down this aisle this way or one way in this it's going to be something I do after and then I'll follow you you see and, and, and we could play that game we could play that game of keeping up the front and all of that but until you and I get serious about this call that spirit of Judas still lingers I mean, sure, you can hang out, like, in church and, and all that, and you could learn even, like, the whole lingo. I could speak good church and ease and all that kind of stuff. But, like, if I don't get real, I'm going to find that I am betraying my own soul. You know, this is another way of saying, like, I have idolatry in my life. And God said, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. That's like the big one of the ten, the big ten, right? Uh, John, at the end of 1 John, I mean, he says as he's signing off, he's like an old man. He's been in this, the pastor of this church for, for decades at this point in time. He, he signs off 1 John by saying, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. It has been decades since they've given themselves to idols of silver and gold. Then why did he say this to them? Because there's some idols that are more dangerous than carved things. There's idols of the heart. And what we just got done describing about self is an idol of self. 
And that could be a difficult one, very difficult one to destroy. Jesus said, this is how it's destroyed. You deny yourself, and you pick up your cross daily, and you follow me. You deny yourself. Don't say it. I know you want it. Don't say it. Don't buy it. Don't do that thing. Do unity. Do unity. This means dying to self to make sure there's unity. Do love. That means dying to self and thinking of another person first. Do devotions. That means dying to my busy and giving and spending my time quiet with Jesus. Choose. That's it. Choose. Make a choice. Like it's been given to you. 20,000, over 20,000 disciples chose that Jesus was just too much. 11 didn't. And you know what? That 11, because they didn't, it would, that 11 would become a multitude. And that multitude would not only change their region, it would change the world. 11. 11 did that because they had a perceived need. They dealt with self and they knew where they wanted to end. And we can end just as well. Hey, he has the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? Let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you that you made these things even pointed at times. You made these things hard. You made them so that we could just understand them. God, show us. Show us where we're just deceiving self. Show us where we have idols in our hearts of self, God. Show us like where we've taken on the spirit of Judas and we're just living in this place of compromise and it's going to wipe us out if we don't deal with it. Jesus, we want to know you, the power of your resurrection, fellowship of your sufferings. We want to be who you designed us to be. We want to see our region impacted. We want to see this world impacted, God. Lord, you know how absolutely necessary it is for your peace to come upon this world right now. Use us as agents of that peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. Hey, we are at the property today, 9 and 11. Well, you're catching this, 11. Um, and next week as well, we're outside on that. That's our phase two. Phase three is going to be right around the corner. Listen for details on that. And again, you know, if you want to support the ministry, right there, okay? Just that, that, well, don't click that button, but go to our website, Calvary from Home, and you'll see that button. Just hit it, and um, you can support the ministry from there. I'll see you guys soon.